everybody. My name is Dale Guffey, and this is a short overview of some important information about advanced care directives. The most common of these is a will, but we're going to go a little bit beyond that in this presentation. To begin with, let's keep in mind this is an overview of North Carolina law only. Every state has its own unique legal system, and uh, I am not even pretending to know the laws and the regulations and the ins and outs of any other state. Planning for your estate can be complicated, and honestly, questions about your specific situation really should be directed to a competent attorney in your own jurisdiction there. Somebody who specializes in that area of law is the best choice, of course, but the idea behind this is to give you the information that you need to answer some questions, to ask some questions, and to understand the answers that you receive, and to be confident about getting those answers. So as we go through this, we're really trying to answer four questions. What are the choices that we have for end-of-life treatment? What are the choices that you want? Who needs to know those choices? And how can you communicate those choices to those people who need to know? So as I've already mentioned, a last will and testament, a will, is the most common one. Now, a will, you need to know a couple of things here. They take effect at death. They can be altered. They can be revoked at any time prior to that. Properly drawn wills and the legal requirements vary somewhat from state to state. They simply explain how a person's property, land, vehicles, jewelry, shotguns, whatever, should be distributed after the death of the testator. That's the fancy legal word for somebody who makes a last will and testament. Um, it's, it's a little bit funny in that the law distinguishes between males and females. A male is a testator. A female is a testatrix. So if you want to wow your attorney, you can hit them with some of the, these words when you go in. If you die with a will, you are said to die testate. If you die without a will, you are said to die intestate. Think of it this way. A, a will expresses the will of the testator regarding what should happen to property. It is viewed by the law as words of command, not just expressions of desire, not just I would like. That's that's not what a will does. A will only is saying, do this. It is given tremendous, tremendous respect within the law. So that is all well and good, but an awful lot of Americans don't have a will. And even more Americans don't have the other documents that we're going to talk about here. And really, it's because as a society, we don't like talking about life and death. So when faced with decisions, especially about life support, many families have to really struggle here. They're asking, what's the right thing to do? Families suffer from indecision. They really wish someone else would make the decision for them. And in these horrible, horrible situations that are not anticipated, doctors are asking for direction from confused, bewildered, grieving families. So it's really important that we, we talk and that we need to talk and that we normalize talking about this. When we can't tell our loved ones what to do, our choices about what is the right thing to do are locked away. And no one has the key to unlock it. So our loved ones have to guess. And that, that actually puts a tremendous burden on people. This is complicated. Back in the day, 
even 50 years ago, life support as we know it didn't really exist. If a person's heart stopped beating or their breathing stopped, we, we knew the person had died. We said the person's time had come and that was that. But it is incredibly different today because of technology. Now a person can be brain dead, can have no activity, but can still have a heartbeat and breathe with the assistance of machines. A person can be comatose from permanent brain damage and live with machines. So talking about our desires and our wishes, if we find them, ourselves in that situation, that's the loving thing to do. We prepare our families and our, our, our close friends, our, whether our family is blood family or chosen family, we're preparing them for the decisions that, that very well may come. We enable them to support our choices instead of asking them to guess. This is accomplished through a living will, and it's a way to, figuratively speaking, rise up from the hospital bed and tell your loved ones what you want them to do. You're giving them comfort. They're not making the decision. They're carrying out your decision that you have already made. So now, while you are healthy and happy and everything is going okay, this is the time to talk. It's the only way for other people to know the right thing. So in advanced care planning, we clarify what our choices are. We figure out what we think is right for us, and we make sure our loved ones know what those wishes are. We develop a plan to share those wishes with our loved ones through conversations, through discussions, and also through writing. So, what are the choices we have? We have to go through really four things here. Do you want life support at all? If you do want life support, do you want it perpetually or would you want it stopped at some point? There's a question that needs to be addressed here about artificial nutrition and hydration, usually called tube feeding. And whom do you want to make these decisions if you cannot express them yourself. So we're going to step through all of this. We're going to start with the what's a living will. In North Carolina, it's not actually called a living will. The document has a different name. It's a declaration for a desire for a natural death. But living will is, is shorter and honestly a little catchier. So a living will is a legal document that clearly expresses what your wishes are regarding medical care and treatment that you either want or you don't want in the event that you can't speak for yourself. Keep in mind, as long as you can speak for yourself, these documents that we're talking about, a living will, a, a health care power of attorney, a power of attorney, they, they have no impact. As long as you can speak for yourself, you speak for yourself. But if you can't, the documents provide guidance and a very clear record of what you want done. Without a living will, doctors will generally take whatever extraordinary measures are necessary to keep you alive, regardless of your chances for actual recovery. Keep in mind, the term living will should not be confused with last will. A last will and testament, there's this whole process called probate that your executor goes through. Living wills don't do that. Living wills take effect prior to death because they are spelling out what care you want given to you or what you want withheld. So this is a big thing and we need to talk about this. And honestly, we need a little history here. So we're going to talk a little bit about three young women, Karen Ann Quinlan, who was 21, Nancy Cruzon was 25, Terry Schiavo was 26. I include their ages because we usually 
don't think about these issues affecting people in their 20s, when in reality, they often affect people in their 20s, early 30s. They're adults, they're not children, but some, some tragic things have happened. So we're gonna go through these in chronological order. Karen Ann Quinlan, she was our first big case here in this country. She became comatose from lack of oxygen to the brain and was put on a respirator in 1975. Her family wanted to remove her from the respirator, arguing she would not want to continue in that way. The, now, this was in New Jersey. The Supreme Court of New Jersey in 1976 ruled that Karen's ha Karen had a right to privacy that included a right to refuse medical treatment and that under these circumstances, her father could assume this right in her place. It, it's, co it's complicated because you're having to jump through hoops because nothing was written down. You never want to have to go to the court. It's expensive, it's time consuming. But the Quinlan case prompted the adoption of brain death as the legal definition of death in some states and it recognized the quote, right to die and also the recognition of living wills in other states. Karen Ann Quinlan was removed from the respirator. She managed to breathe on her own after the respirator was removed and she remained in a coma. She, she never came out of the coma. She remained in the coma for another 10 years, dying in 1985. Nancy Cruzon was comatose and on this feeding tube after a single car wreck in 1983. After two years, her family decided that their Nancy was gone. The problem was, although her state recognized living wills, she had net left no clear indication of what she wanted. This is in Missouri. The family had to fight the state of Missouri for five years. The Supreme Court of the United States eventually got involved they found the right to privacy and liberty included the right to refuse medical procedures when that right was clearly expressed. The true tragedy of the Cruzon case is Cruzon wasn't dying. She could have lived on the feeding tube for decades. Now, oral expression of your wishes, that's fine, but they're really hard to prove. Courts have to get involved. This is gonna complicate and lengthen the process. Talking is important, but the problem here is when one family member says one thing was said and someone else says another thing was said, having things written down makes everything simpler. And it gives family members reassurance again that they're doing the right thing. Cruzon was ultimately removed from the feeding tube and she died in 1990. Terry Schiavo. Terry Schiavo suffered massive brain damage following a cardiac arrest in 1990. Okay. Her husband wanted the feeding tube removed. Her parents did not. The legal challenges began in 1993 and they lasted until... 2005. This case is just completely tragic. The courts, again, with proper documentation, never would have gotten involved. As it is, Terry's feeding tube was removed three times in 2001, 2003, and for the final time in 2005 which was 15 years after the initial injury in 1990. Her case was sad, incredibly public, but unfortunately not uncommon. Probably neither, I hate to use the word side, but probably neither side, parents versus husband, ever thought they'd be at the center of a, a national firestorm about living wills it really raises two questions. How can the situation be avoided 
and how to take care of all of this. So here we start looking at our, our choices. There are no right or wrong answers here. These are questions that need to be considered thoughtfully and carefully. The first one is, do I want life support used in my care? Some people do not. Some people say something along these lines. Do not put me on machines or use CPR on me. When my heart stops or my breathing stops, let me be. Folks who have a religious background often say things like, God is calling me home, let me go. Or, I don't think machines will help what is wrong with me. These are statements people typically make who don't want any form of life support. They either have religious objections to the use of extraordinary means, or they're already greatly suffering from serious illnesses, and they don't wish to prolong the dying process. For these folks, there is something called a portable DNR form for do not resuscitate. This form can be incredibly useful in getting their desires recognized. It allows a person to say that not using life support at all is the right thing to do. This is supported under North Carolina law. It is the only document that will stop emergency medical personnel from providing CPR. Otherwise, they are mandated by law to initiate CPR. Uh, you do not want copies of this. You want originals. Copies might not be followed by EMS. Only the original is considered valid. So if you decide to go this route and get a North Carolina portable DNR form signed by a doctor, you want multiple originals. And a lawyer can easily help you with this. The second question, or the second choice, is either I want tube feeding used indefinitely, regardless of my condition, or I don't want to be stuck on tube feeding if I'm dying or comatose with no help, no hope of waking up. Um, this is a really big issue, and we need to talk about tube feeding. Lots of people have discussed CPR or breathing machines, but they haven't talked about tube nutrition, tube hydration. And a family that doesn't know what to do about these issues will usually continue it. Is that what you want? Again, there is no right or wrong answer here. Interestingly enough, because both the Cruzan case and the Shivo case involved uh, artificial hydration and nutrition. Although statistics are a little hard to come by, in the Cruzon case in the late 1980s, it's estimated we had about 10,000 people in America who were being kept alive through artificial hydration and nutrition. Now it is estimated we have about three times that number this is a need that is not anticipated, so it's not communicated. Families often will continue the treatment by default to avoid possible guilt. So if you have an internal picture of not wanting to be kept alive on machines, this has got to be discussed as well, okay? The vast majority of persons say they don't want to be kept in a comatose state on artificial feeding or artificial hydration. Again, it is estimated today there are about 30,000 persons who are maintained by tube feeding in the USA. And of these, roughly 80% were under the age of 30 when they started being kept alive on tubes. Is that what they wanted? This is really the big issue. In the Terry Schiavo case, she wasn't on a respirator or other machines. She had had this massive brain injury and was being kept alive through, because she couldn't feed herself. She couldn't uh, take in 
hydration on her, on her own. So this is something that just has got to be considered. So you look at something like the uh, Shivo situation where the, the person was in a car accident or, or a medical emergency. The body is fine, but the brain is not. After some period of time, the doctors believe that this person will not wake up. The brain damage is permanent. The brain damage is severe. Tube feeding, of course, is being used while there's hope that the person can wake up. But when that is no longer a viable possibility, what do you want your family to do? So this is something you need to consider and then talk about. On a living will, people can express preferences about this situation, about machines like respirators and heart machines, but also about things like tube feeding and uh, hydration. The living will does not prohibit tube feeding in any way, nor does it imagine that it is not to be used when there is hope for recovery. You can specify however you want you can say, I want it used here. I don't want it used here. But please, please, please understand there is nothing in there that says that extraordinary measures are not to be taken while there is realistic hope of recovery. So that gets us into choice number three. I want life support, but I don't want to be stuck on machines indefinitely. So this is where you are saying, I want life support here. I don't want life support here. So if your heart or your breathing stops and life support will help you, you're saying, I definitely want that used but I don't want to be stuck on it if life support will not help me get better, will not help me wake up. And in this choice, people often have a mental picture of being in an ICU bed stuck on machines, subjected to overly aggressive medical care without any hope of getting better. This person is saying life support does no good in this situation. They don't want it used anymore when the burdens of treatment outweigh the benefits of treatment. And the person needs to think about when that balance tips, when there is more burden than there is benefit. This is sometimes called turtle time. What that means is after the rush of initial care is over and the dust has settled, time seems to slow down to kind of a creep and important decisions need to be made. You have got to have these conversations with family, certainly with your physician, with clergy, if you go in that direction and you want, the, you want spiritual support and you want your family to have spiritual support. All of these conversations need to be had, but you also really need the written document. That's gonna make everything easier. OK, so let's say you've had these conversations. This gets us into, well, if you cannot speak for yourself, as long as you can speak for yourself, that's what you're going to do. But if you can't speak for yourself, who do you want to make these decisions? Who do you want to act on the decisions that you have expressed in these documents? OK. So we already know the living will says either keep me on machines forever, keep me on machines here, here, and here, or says I don't want to be stuck on machines. You really can customize this. But just because you have it customized, who's going to make the decision? Who's going to enact it? All right. This is where we get into a document called the Healthcare POA, or Power of Attorney. Again, as long as you can, you are going to make your own decisions. 
If you are unable to communicate your decisions, the person that you have named as your health care power of attorney is authorized to make those decisions on your behalf. It does not become effective while you're able to make your own decisions. Absolutely not. And keep in mind, a health care power of attorney is different from a general power of attorney. So let's talk about these two differences. A general power of attorney, this will also allow somebody to deal with your bank account, collect rent if you have rental property, deal with finances. A general power of attorney only has the power to say yes to medical treatment, and it's the document that allows somebody to pay for medical treatment. Again, they have access to your bank account. They can collect rent. They can deal with other securities that you might own, that kind of thing. The health care power of attorney, that gives the person the right to say yes or no to medical treatment based on what you have specified. Okay. The health care power of attorney has a lot of value in today's climate of privacy, a lot. And I heartily recommend, for what it's worth, that a person have this in place. But who should you pick? Most people choose family members, either a spouse or children, but you can choose whoever you want. Please, please, please think about this. You need to choose a person you trust, someone who knows your choices, so you've had these discussions, someone who will make the, the decisions that you want and will act in your best interest. Please keep in mind the healthcare power of attorney, this is really important, cannot share decision-making authority. This is one person. Now, if your first choice isn't available, you can specify when you fill out the healthcare power of attorney with an attorney. You can specify alternates, but it's only one person at any given time. So again, now is really the time to talk. While you have taken in this information, while you have done some serious thinking about what you want, now you have to communicate those choices. Talk is really good, but you also need to complete written documents so there is no question about what was said and what your decisions are if you get in a situation where you cannot speak for yourself. So here we're talking about, let's just review, a living will, a health care power of attorney, a general power of attorney, sometimes called a durable power of attorney, a North Carolina portable do not resuscitate form. Again, if you're in North Carolina, and if that is your choice, and your will. So let's look at completion here. The living will and the health care power of attorney need to be signed before a notary and witnesses. Witnesses cannot be related to you, either by blood or by marriage. Honestly, you need strangers. As crazy as that sounds, you need people who do not have an interest in the outcome. They can't work for your health care. They cannot be named in your will. These are disinterested people. If you decide you want a portable do not resuscitate form, that has to be signed by your doctor. Your doctor is obviously going to want to discuss your choice with you. But because, again, this is a this is a big decision. Now, a documentation sheet can be used to provide documentation beyond the doctor's records. And honestly, that can be important in situations where the family wants to call back the DNR. Uh, this signed documentation sheet attached to the portable DNR reassures a medical staff that the DNR is right, even though the family says 
otherwise. And it needs to be signed by you, not your family, because a family can change the mind. So you don't want that, okay? So quick summary here, because these presentations always wind up getting a little long. Advanced care planning, the quick summary is this is a process for planning end of life care that enables you to learn the choices that you have. Clarify those choices, consider who needs to know your choices and communicate your choices to those people. So for the last time, I'll remind you, now is the time to talk to your family members, to your close friends, to your doctor, to your clergy. If you have questions, I am available to answer those. I am, again, K. Dale Guffey, and you can reach me through my email, kdale.guffey at gmail.com. Thank you very much, and remember, now is the time to talk. Thank you. Bye-bye.